I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And uh, what's <laughs> what's funny about this whole situation is, um, I so I graduated uh, a year early in in high school, and um, my dream was to be a race car engineer. So I went into engineering, right? And uh, as soon as I got to school, I I started to struggle. I I was a good student, um, you know. As an example, like my you know, going to physics and math class and in high school, the teacher actually thought I was cheating because uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take notes. I would just sit there and kind of learn, learn the processes, right? Math is essentially a process. And uh, he actually made me rewrite the, the final exam in grade 12. So anyways, I get into university and start engineering and find out there is a lot of studying and a lot of memorization. And honestly, I'm not very good at memorization. And I really started to struggle. And when I went to the kind of career counselor in uh, in the engineering fal- faculty, uh, I told him, oh, I want to be a race car engineer because I love cars. And they essentially told me there's no way that you're going to do that. This was in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is a, a prairie town essentially in Canada. And they're like, oh, you're going to work for Manitoba Hydro or, you know, you're going to work for, for the city. And I said, forget it. And... Um, at that time I had an inkling for entrepreneurship. My grandfather ran an incense business, uh, at at kind of a local market. And, you know, the idea of being able to work for myself or build for myself was, was really exciting. So this would have been what, 17, 18 years old. I tried drop shipping on eBay. Uh, it was terrifying for me and I, I never really made any money. But anyways, uh, when I realized that the engineering path that was set in front of me wasn't, um, you know, wasn't what I wanted. I, I went into business school and, uh, same thing. I was, it was an economics and sociology and all of these ridiculous classes and sitting there listening to economics from a teacher that has never run a business. And I got in, I went into business school to start a business. And, uh, anyways, I double dropped out long story short. And, uh, so this would have been what, maybe 20 or 21. And, I never really had a mentor really kind of early on regarding, you know, business. I was, I was, you know, kind of single mom household type thing. And, um, you know, I eventually, you know, found the internet stuff and, and tried and failed at this time. YouTube didn't really exist. There was no, there was no real courses. There was uh, something called the warrior forums. And, uh, you know, so I bought a couple small things, but I never really took action anyways. Fast forward to when I left Winnipeg, moved to Vancouver and started working at, uh, I call it my corporate job. It really wasn't a uh, small business in the GPS tracking uh, space. And I started off as just a support manager. I was answering support tickets. Uh, previously, I had um, car audio installation experience. So that's what they hired me for. And uh, that that owner uh, was really the first mentor that I really had. And he... He beat me up. <laughs> he beat me up pretty good, but he he sort of challenged me in a way that nobody else had challenged me before. But in a place of, uh, you know, invest in yourself and and growth. That's where you know I started to learn about audiobooks and that, you know, any book you can you can have a mentor from a book. And I quickly went from support manager to operations manager of that company in about six or eight months. And um, you know, there was a sales team that was in there that was crushing. They became really, really close friends. And, um, you know, and then we, as we were growing the company, you know, I think we took it from, uh, you know, 1.5 million to about 3 million in a year. There's like 10 employees. There's like 10 employees. So the, the entrepreneur was, was slowing down. And in hindsight, looking back, he was actually getting ready to sell the company. And that's why they weren't expanding. And they were just trying to get their, you know, their balance sheet looking great. Uh, but I, I got really frustrated because I wanted to grow and I saw all these opportunities to invest, etc. cetera. And um, uh, I started to get very frustrated in my position. And, you know, him and I had a great talk. And the reason why I actually moved to Vancouver is I went to a festival uh, called Shambhala and I fell in love with the mountains. And my, my dream was to become an audio engineer or, or music producer and, um, you know, live that dream. So him and I started getting talking and... Uh, he just basically told me, he's like, bro, you're, you're, you're an entrepreneur through and through. You like to solve problems. You like to add value. Uh, why not go start your own business? So I, I did, I ended up, uh, putting some SOPs in place and hiring my replacement. I actually ended up working for another four or five months for him. 
And I left and went cold turkey completely and started my record label. And uh, that was the last job I ever had. And that was, geez, maybe 10 years ago. Um, so uh, ultimately, yeah, the, the entrepreneurship thing was really like I wanted to do it. I didn't really have any clarity on how I was going to do it. But uh, really that mentor and working in that, you know, small business environment and seeing what he was doing on a daily basis and how he's leading the team and investing in people and creating value. That was really my first like real taste of entrepreneurship. And I'm like, oh, I want that. And, uh, you know, luckily it gave me sort of a launch pad to go do my own thing. Obviously a lot has changed since, you know, the last 10 years, but that was essentially my first um, jump into entrepreneurship. It was a, it was a software as a service um, based business. And um, I grew up in hospitality, my, my family, uh, we're all in the restaurant industry and uh, thankfully they, you know, they begged me to not, to not get into it. Uh, very early on, I was actually throwing shows in Winnipeg and kind of part of the, the, the club scene. But uh, one of the downfalls of the hospitality industry is you can get stuck, you know, you, it's maybe fun in your 20s and 30s, but, you know, the last okay. thing that most people want to do is be 40 or, or 50 years old working in the restaurant industry. But I got a lot of my... Uh, you know, like core values and like love for the hospitality and like serving people from from growing up in that environment. And, um, you know, that's in a lot of reasons why the, the businesses that I have, I want a direct connection to customers because, you know, the money's great and, and, you know, selling products is fun. But for me, if I can't see the the happiness or the the joy of, of serving somebody, it's almost like the money doesn't matter. And that's why the portfolio of companies that I've got now are all primarily based in either some sort of hospitality or, or service-based. Um, you know, we do have physical products uh, as well that we do sell, but uh, I would say, yeah, primarily it's mostly service-based. My first client is a, a really funny story. And, um, you know, my number one core value is deep, meaningful relationships. And my first two clients with the SEO agency were actually people that I saw every day. Um, so at the time I was living in Cole Harbor, Vancouver and, um, you know, I had a puppy Zaya who I take on a walk every day. And this was at the time when, uh, I was kind of tapering down on the Kindle publishing and for very similar points that I was mentioning, um, one of the issues with, with publishing on, on Amazon is you don't have direct connection with the customer. So although I was, you know, I was crushing, you know, 15, $16,000 a month at the time, and this is God, five, six years ago, actually maybe longer. Um, I was really craving for, for connection and, uh, you know, a, a mentor of mine, uh, Dan Locke, who I, I joined his mastermind, again, maybe about three or four years ago, uh, gave me the idea to start, start an agency. And because I had Amazon experience and I love search marketing, I love it. I love solving people's problems. I decided to step into the SEO world. So, uh, decided to buy a course. I think it was like $8,000 or something crazy like that. It was like $500 a month, which to me at that time uh, was was scary, to be completely honest with you. But I made the commitment and uh, the, the way that they sold the program was like, if you get one client at $500 a month, it will cover the, you know, it'll cover the course payment. And then you essentially have this information for free. And I was like, you know what, that really makes sense. So uh, there was actually a doggy daycare, not doggy daycare, sorry, a dog store downstairs, exactly where I lived. Um, and they also did dog grooming. And then there was actually a coffee shop right down the street from where I lived. And again, I would see these guys every day. You know, I'd go downstairs, walk into the dog shop, I'd get, you know, I'd get dog treats. And we just started talking. And then I realized that these were business owners that could potentially need help. Now, in hindsight, a coffee shop and doing SEO is <laughs> definitely not the right move but uh, all I did is I told him like look uh, I think I can really add a lot of value to your company and I offered them a money-back guarantee and the thing is is I had relationships built with them over over time so this was not some sort of cold prospecting and uh, I dove in and funny enough both clients were $500 a month the coffee shop we ended up uh, not not pursuing long term, uh, ended up doing like a website redevelopment, and uh, you know, kind of cleaning up their website and tracking, etc. 
Uh, and then Dog Store, I ended up working with them for probably about a year, year and a half. Uh, she's still a very close friend of mine. Uh, but the, the interesting thing here is I just led with relationship and said, hey, I think I can help you in this way. And, um, you know, this wasn't me selling something that I didn't know. But the reality is I wasn't an expert in any stretch, but I knew more than they did. And I knew that I could execute more than they could. And ultimately on an agency side, you're saving people time. So that's what I really identified as is like, look, you guys don't have any attention to your website, to Google, to any of the search marketing. Let me do this. And then I quantified something, you know, so for the dog store, if the average person is selling or, or purchasing 50 to $60 when they walk in or a groom might be 60 or $70, uh, you know, I installed some tracking, Google Analytics, and we looked at the revenue and I said, look, if all we do is get an extra 15 people or 20 people next month into your store, would that be worth it to you? And it's funny, even till today, this is the exact same way that I sell with my agency um, is, you know, we take a look at the business, understand their average order value, understand, uh, you know, the traffic, get conversion in place. And then essentially, if I see a win, this is where I say, look, let me save you the time um, and let me execute it. But uh, coming back to the main question of how did I get my first client? Ultimately, it was just relationships that I had built and going through my network and figuring out people that I had a strong relationship with that I had trust built already. And then essentially just said, hey, let, let me save you some time and then quantified a, an outcome that would be win-win. Yeah, so this is a great question on do agencies require offices? And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, you know, our agency right now, I think we've got 10 employees, uh, I believe as of today, 10 or 11, and it's a completely remote team. Uh, what is challenging, and I think in an even deeper question to this is how do you build culture without an office? Um, you know, especially with the, you know, the health crisis going on right now, work from home has become uh, greater and greater. And we currently use Slack and a software called ClickUp you know, there's a Santa base camp, there's, there's tons of project management software. Um, but really, I think that the key question, especially from an entrepreneur standpoint, or manager standpoint is how do you maintain culture um, and connection with your team, uh, despite having an office, uh, an office is fantastic. You know, you have the ability, ability to see people face to face. And uh, there is definitely productivity there. But uh, we've definitely learned uh, a way to not only scale our team, I think we went from like three or four employees last year to now 10. So we've added another six employees or seven employees. Um, but really, I think the systems around culture and, and creating community on a daily basis is important. So we've got daily check-ins on our Slack. Um, people are commenting on their reports at the end of the day. Uh, I do video calls to make sure, um, you know, we're getting actual FaceTime. It's very easy for us to Zoom without you know, without a camera. Um, and then I personally have at least three meetings with the with the team during the week that are via video. And then Friday, we have a recap where we talk about our biggest wins of the week and then rooms for improvement. So I think we're going to move more and more to kind of a decentralized work environment where um, not having an office is important. But uh, alternatively, I have friends that have offices that are absolutely crushing. And there is absolutely something to be said about everybody showing up and being in the same room. So um, again, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Us personally, we don't have an office right now, though. Getting paid to think is a common communication within our company. And um, that and, and invest in yourself. And uh, the way that technology is moving right now, it's, it's incredible. You've got softwares like Canva now that essentially leapfrog needing to learn Photoshop. And I think everybody's fairly familiar with Canva. Um, even internally within our team right now, what used to be manual work where we would manually scrape a website to, um, you know, find things like titles and meta descriptions and, and images. Well, now there's automated software to do that. Uh, you know, you even look at a grocery store now and you go to these self-service checkouts and these are being replaced. You know, Tesla's launching self-driving cars now and, you know, they're commenting on wanting to replace truck drivers. So. There's sort of a twofold to the to this question. And really, as technology continues to move faster and faster, a lot of these very manual types of work are going to be automated or commoditized. You know, we look at Fiverr as an example, and 
I know people that are graphic designers that are fantastic in the North American market, but because of globalization now in, in with the internet, there's somebody in in you know the Philippines or Serbia or or they could even be in Bali or Costa Rica right now where the cost of living is so much cheaper, and it's hard it's hard to compete. And uh, what we're finding more and more is that the technical skills are actually not as valuable versus this and the the strategic thinking, the creative thinking. Let's use let's use uh, Canva as an example. So we've got an employee on our, on our team that that is a graphic designer and uh, or came in as a graphic designer, but I've been challenging him to become the creative director. And what do I mean by that? Uh, the the tasks that he's doing, the graphic design, the video editing, the thumbnail editing, etc., being really transparent, it's actually not that valuable. But we transfer that to something like a Super Bowl billboard. If you took a Super Bowl billboard and copied it and pasted it and asked any graphic designer on Fiverr to copy it, anybody could get it done for $5. I think we can agree with that. But the strategy behind that advertisement is where the big money is, right? And people will pay a million dollars for that. You know, we're seeing photo ads right now on Facebook, just a very simple banner, right? We look at Black Friday or Cyber Monday or coming up to the Christmas holidays. One, one image can create a million dollars worth of revenue for somebody. But it's funny, the task is exactly the same, right? It's still just graphic design, it's picking colors. But the difference between a commoditized product and paid to think is that creative aspect. So really when I talk about getting paid to think, it's not the what you're doing, but the why you're doing it. And, and this type of skill set is essentially irreplaceable. I mean, we may come to a time five years, 10 years from now where artificial intelligence or softwares can do that. But if you're constantly on the cutting edge of paid to think, that's where it really creates value. And then there's kind of the adage of, you know, a, a plumber shows up to your house and, you know, the hot water tank is leaking and your your basement is flooding. And as that flood is happening, you're thinking of, oh my God, the insurance and everything is gonna get ruined. In your mind, it's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars that's going to get resolved, right? Or get, sorry, it's going to get ruined. And this plumber comes in and fixes it with, in five minutes. Um, you're so thankful that it didn't ruin your whole basement. But really all he did is maybe take a wrench and turn one, you know, one screw or one, yeah, one screw. Uh, is it really turning the screw that the tactic of turning a screw, well, anybody could do that. No, it's the ability to troubleshoot and actually identify the problem and solve that problem is what's what's really valuable. So this is kind of the analogy of paid to think. Um, I think far too often people are too stuck on the technical and tactical, which are important. You know, you need to be able to use Photoshop if you're gonna be a graphic designer. But the, the value of paid to think for the employees is that they get to level themselves up and be become more valuable. And then it gives them the ability to pitch me for more money or pitch clients for more money, which really means create more value. Um, the, the tactics are commoditized. The pay to think is, is completely abundant and, and, and hyper valuable, if that makes sense. Yeah, so this is a fantastic question. And I believe every entrepreneur that um, is is working uh, that is a solopreneur, so an employee or uh, you know a business owner of one. I believe that their first hire should be an executive assistant. Um, I love all of my staff a lot, and and they know that. But uh, Veronica, my executive assistant, has been the most important hire um, I've made as a as an entrepreneur, and I wish I had done it earlier. So previously, I'd actually hired staff, but. Um, what, what happens with most solopreneurs is they have to wear every hat on kind of startup, right? They're, they're doing sales, they're doing marketing, they're doing fulfillment, they're doing finance, uh, all of these aspects that, that are needed in a business. And then for me personally, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, I don't want to use the word visionary, but I'm much more on the creative thinking end than the operational tightness. And that's just who I am. Um, you know, there's, there's communication around visionary and integrator, essentially the integrator being the more operations person. And then you've got the visionary who's more creative and, and forward thinking. Um, so when I was kind of at my wits end, I think I had 10 or 11 clients at the time 
every time I hired staff, it just felt like another obligation and more energy for me to uh, to spend. And ultimately, I failed multiple times because of this because I just didn't have the energy to manage it. And I thought it was a me issue. You know, I knew I needed staff, but I just couldn't. I just couldn't get it together. And um, then I then I had a close friend and mentor uh, recommend, look, man, hire an executive assistant so that she can take things off your plate to create bandwidth. And um, I think with everybody, when they think about an executive assistant, it was, well, how am I going to find time or like not time? How am I going to fill her time? There's not enough t uh, tasks in my day to give to her. She's going to be sitting around. All these questions came up, right? Like, how am I going to? Uh, essentially quantify having somebody working for me for four hours a day. And when it started, it was really simple. It was just things like email, um, calendar invites. But as we started getting to go, Veronica really started to free up my bandwidth. And our relationship now is essentially, um, my job is to solve the biggest problems within the company. That's my job as an entrepreneur. The team members that are in other areas of the business kind of help identify the problems. So I'll just use graphic design as an example. Hey, D1, we need some retargeting campaigns set up for X, Y, Z. Uh, that attention is being given to me by the people that are specialists in their role. Veronica helps facilitate me solving those problems. So whether that's, you know, creating a standard operating procedure or identifying that we need one, uh, setting up meetings, capturing emails, uh, and she's essentially allowing me to focus on higher leverage thinking. And she's sort of helping me through admin, through setting up calls or appointments, or even research. Um, the, the idea that an executive assistant just answers your email and sets up appointments is sort of almost that paid to think conversation that I had, right? Where yes, tactically that's what it is, but on a macro level, it's allowing me and her to solve the biggest problems within the company. What's beautiful about that is that Veronica is hyper-organized Honestly, she's like a babysitter for me, if I'm completely honest. She's sending me task lists on a daily basis, reminders, etc. cetera, um, because I'm, I'm quite forgetful, you know? I've got a lot of things coming at me at once. And she's sort of a gatekeeper and filter for me and then helps me prioritize ideas or tasks and is giving me the most urgent or highest leverage tasks. So essentially, it's a second brain for me and she is filling in gaps or skill sets that maybe I'm not super strong at and allowing me to focus on my zone of genius, which is the creative, the planning, the strategy. So it's really a synergetic, uh, synergetic uh, relationship. And really I almost see her as like a partner, not like an assistant um, because we're able to accomplish more together by us kind of playing our lanes, her own kind of the, the, the organization and then me on the uh, more creative. What's also great about this is after that hire, it allowed me to hire another eight employees after that and it never felt like it was more work um, because she was able to kind of filter and help me organize those relationships. So um, I don't think I'd be able to be where I am. I know I wouldn't be able to be where I am without an executive assistant. And just having that secondary support who's keeping you organized and understands your ideal needs and then can kind of coordinate around that, I think is massively valuable for you. So um, I truly believe the executive assistant should be the first hire for, for any entrepreneur that's looking to scale up. Yeah, so this is a great question on why, why have mentors or how a mentor has really changed my life in the last little bit. And I can almost see every season of my life, let's just call it that, um, directly related to to a mentor or um, me studying somebody. Uh, my first sort of, you know, two to three years online, uh, there was a course creator that I followed uh, in the Kindle publishing world and really started to accelerate there. Uh, then I joined a mastermind uh, of like-minded people and I ultimately kind of plateaued. And uh, that's when I actually joined Dan Locke's mastermind group Again, this would have been about four or five years ago now. And uh, it wasn't necessarily the content per se that I learned from that, but it was the tribe around me and being able to see somebody else operate at a level that was higher than me at the time. And uh, my personal learning, learning style is a little bit more of an observant 
where if I see something or somebody shows me how to do something, I can kind of pick it up very quickly. Um, that ended up, that relationship ended up after about a year, uh, you know, we closed down the mastermind group and for like the kind of the last two to three years, to be honest, I can't say that I've had a real direct mentor. And what's funny when you look at mentorship, you look at any of the highest performers, let's just take professional athletes. They've got a nutrition coach. They've got a, you know, a fitness coach. They've got a mindset coach and, uh, any hyper successful person that you see has a coach in, in areas of their life. Uh, what I struggled with, though, to be completely honest with you, was clarity on where I wanted to take the business. Um, you know, with the health, the health crisis going on right now, um, you know, lockdowns happen. Businesses were shutting down. Businesses were, you know, having to change or, or you know, completely pivot. So for me, I, I didn't have a lot of clarity on where I wanted to go. Um, you know, I purchased Airwaves last year and, and it's an events-based company. So it definitely was affected. Um, but coming into this year, my my end goal for 2022 was to be in a position where I didn't work in the business at all, you know, hire rockstar employees that are specialists in what they do and then invest in them, right? So that we can scale up. And, um, you know, the current mentor that I'm working with right now, uh, she's, she's run an agency. She made, I think, $20 million in two years. Uh, but what's funny is that she's actually coaching on mindset. And uh, without going down the rabbit hole too far, I've experienced a lot of burnout you know, in, in waves over the last, you know, three, four years. And I think it's very common for entrepreneurs. Uh, so directly what we're working on right now is working from a place of flow and creativity and um, realizing that there is no race. And you can conceptually understand it here, but to actually work through that is, is quite difficult. So um, it's been really great to work with somebody that's been there, done that, but also understands where I'm at and uh, it's not that I wasn't looking for a mentor. I just couldn't find the person that resonated with me. And I think this is a really uh, important piece of feedback that um, there are lots of successful people out there that have achieved what you want to achieve. But if A, you don't respect them, and I'm not saying I don't respect people, but if you don't respect them, you don't jive with them and like energetically, you don't feel like a long-term fit with them. Wait, wait. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't learn. I mean, I listen to audiobooks all the time. I've got a huge bookshelf here. I'm a, you know, avid YouTube learner. I buy courses. I mean, we've bought, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of courses this year in the agency. But a direct one-on-one -on -one customized relationship where somebody can hold you accountable, but has also been there, done that, and gone through the exact same problem, uh, it, it, it makes things so much easier because they, again, they clearly understand where you're going. Um, as well, I've actually just recently hired a music coach, finally, and very similar thing. I've been following this guy for a long time. I love his music. Very open guy, very community oriented. And uh, it was a very easy, like, yes, let's go and do that. I'm, you know, I'm able to submit two, two songs a month. He gives creative and critical feedback. And then you can communicate your vision with them. And I think this is the difference between a course and mentorship is, a mentorship, you can communicate a uh, an end goal and maybe, you know, let's just use an arbitrary number of, oh, I want to make a million dollars a month, just arbitrary number. Well, maybe that's going to take me three or four years for me to do it myself. But if I can find somebody that's been there, done that, and is in sort of the same industry, has gone through the same problems, and I can clearly articulate the problem that I'm trying to solve, they may be able to leapfrog you and do it in six months because they've been there and done that. And... Uh, because they've stepped on those landmines, they they can communicate that to you so that you don't have to. And if you have an energetic connection where you feel like this person really understands you and you're willing to listen, often you'll implement or implement quicker. But alternatively, if you're taking mentorship from somebody that you really don't resonate with, often they can give you the exact right advice that you need, but you won't take action. And I've experienced this and I've, I've coached people as well where it's been very similar. So I, I really think that the value of a mentor is when you're ready and very clear in what you want to execute on and you've identified somebody else that has already been there done that that you're energetically connected to i think jump on it but what mentorship isn't is like my mentor she's not my mom you know she's not going to do the work for me uh her ideas are valid and important but ultimately i'm the one that's in charge it's my life my business and my execution so that's the only flip side that i want to say a mentor is not going to change your life they're only there to give you new perspective or ideas that maybe you kind of can't thought of yourself, 
But if you're not doing the work and executing, no mentor is going to help you or save you. Um, I think that's a real big fallacy. So yeah, that's ultimately why I got a mentor. I had a couple areas in my life that was very clear that I wanted to execute down. I had a clear path and goal that I wanted to get there. And then I seeked out people that I was energetically connected to who uh, I looked up to and it got the, got the result publicly on what I wanted. And, it, and you know, I, I went from there. Sure, this is a great question around, you know, do you stay at your job while you build a business or do you just leave your job and build a business? Now, uh, I, I jumped cold turkey and just left my job. Um, I have a habit of jumping in front of the bus or jumping off the cliff and building on the way down, but it may not be right for you. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but I do think that there's two aspects here that need to be talked about. So let's go pros and cons. So let's say with staying with your job and building on the side, the, the beautiful aspect of that is that you've got security and that you have income. Now, you know, if you're working a minimum wage job and you're barely making anything, uh, you know, let's just say you're starting an agency as an example. Uh, you very quickly, if you know what you're doing and are able to communicate to people and add value, you could replace your your uh, minimum wage job on the agency very quickly. But alternatively, if you're in something like e-commerce, let's just say you're doing Amazon FBA, it's a very expensive business. Uh, you have to buy inventory, you have to buy ads, things can go wrong. And the biggest issue with starting up uh, as a business is you don't know what you don't know and you need money to be able to make mistakes. Um, internally in the agency, we've got a mindset around 1% better and create. These are two core values, create daily. And if you don't have money, it can be very slow to be able to create daily because you can't afford it, right? Maybe you have to buy inventory. Now, if you're doing a service-based business like an agency, you don't need a website. You don't need a logo. I don't care what anybody tells you. Uh, you can just go and create value there. So the advantage of having a job is that you've got the stability to take risk and continue investing in your business to find that one thing that works. Often entrepreneurship is taking 99 no's to find one yes, and it takes money to do that. Now, alternatively, the on the other end is working your job while starting a business is uh, you may be burnt out after your job, and often you find that if somebody has a plan B or plan C or plan D, plan A never gets done. And um, I find this as, as myself, that if I have too many things going on or too many backup plans, nothing gets done. So razor, razor focus and commitment and, you know, the, the saying of burn the bridges, super valuable too. Uh, and I think when you make that leap and say, look, I'm quitting my job. It's burning me out. I hate what I'm doing. And I want to go pursue something that I really enjoy and I think I can add value on. There's a lot to be said with that where then you're completely all in and you're going to do what it takes. And ultimately, entrepreneurship is just failing forward. You know, you you don't know what you don't know and you're just trying things, right? You're getting feedback. There's really no right or wrong, but you try something, you get feedback. And then that feedback loop is where you figure out if you're getting closer to your goal or further away. And you need, need to be able to sustain that. So on the job, if you have a job, you've got money, but maybe you don't have the energy. And when you quit your job, maybe you've got the energy, but you may not have money. So trying to figure out what that balance is, I think is really important. I think a hybrid model might be going and figuring out a job where maybe it's part-time. Maybe you bartend on the weekend and, and make money that way. And it allows you to work, you know, Monday to Thursday on your business full-time. Um... Or, you know, maybe you take a sales job where there's a little bit more commission and you've got some more flexibility. Um, so that's kind of my thoughts on it. I don't think there's a right or wrong, but really it just comes down to those two questions. There's time and then there's money. And, um, you know, at the startup phase, it's, it's going to take both and it's up to you to kind of figure out uh, what you value more or what you have more of and then offset that. So if you don't have a lot of money, guess what? You're going to be spending a lot of time. Um, but if you don't have either, you don't have money and time, uh, I would say go and, and try to find time first and, and push your way through. So if you had to kind of put a gun to my head, that would be my answer.